And if you have your Bibles, we are in John chapter 1. And we're going to read the, the scriptures we were looking at last week. We're going to read those again. And then we're going to be all over the Bible. We're going to be all over the place. But uh, let's start out there at John chapter 1, verse 43. And it says, The following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. And we're going to pause right there. That's what we're going to be looking at. When Philip said, We have found him, in whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote. So Philip is saying, I've been looking. I've been studying. He's going to Nathaniel and saying, you've been studying with me. We've been looking for this one. I believe that's what Andrew and John were doing there with John the Baptist. They were studying. They were looking for that one. And they went after Jesus. And when they had found him, they went and found Peter and said, hey, we have found the Messiah. So this whole group was looking for the Messiah. I believe they were a part of a group. And that Jesus wanted to go to Galilee to find Philip because he'd already now spoken to Andrew and Peter, which was their hometown, and now they're going to find Philip in that same place. And Philip's going to come away saying, Guys, what, do you, what have you found? Who's this Jesus? And he comes away saying, This is the Messiah. And he goes off after Nathaniel with the same encouragement, the same words. Remember I said John, the, the writer of the Gospels, is always giving us new information, trying to help us to see things. See, in the other Gospels, we got to hear Peter come up with this revelation. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. In John's Gospel, we don't get to hear Peter say that. We don't get to hear John say that. We do get to hear Philip say it, Andrew say it, Nathaniel say it. We get to see others proclaim it. So we know at the beginning of the ministry... These other ones also were looking for the Messiah, and they were thinking and believing that Jesus was the one. Later on, we're going to hear Peter say that. But John is giving us some inside information. So here's their beginning. They were looking for the Messiah. And whatever Jesus was saying in these, and whatever they were experiencing, they were coming away saying, we think we found him. So let's look at the scriptures they were looking at in Moses and the prophets on why this would have them so charged up that Jesus was the one. All right, let's look at it. This is the first one here in Genesis. This would be in what they would call the law of Moses. And I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. And, and, and amazing, it's not dealing with Adam in this. Adam's messed everything up, but by the seed of the woman... By your seed, bypassing Adam, he will bruise your head. Speaking of the seed of the woman, he, singular, that seed is singular. It's a person. It's a he. He will bruise your head, meaning he's going to affect your authority. He's going to knock out your authority. And you shall bruise his heel, meaning you shall wound him. You shall uh, bruise him physically. But he's going to take you out. So here's God in the garden right away saying one is coming. And if they understood that, they're saying, well, God was sending somebody and it's a he. It's a singular. It's a person. All right, go to the next one. This is Genesis 22 where we looked about Abraham sacrificing Isaac on uh, a hill in Jerusalem, which, you know, I've told you my own personal belief it was it was at Calvary. And having ready to sacrifice him, the uh, voice from heaven stopped him from doing it. And in saying that he had faith to, to deliver up his own son, God said, I'm going to do something. And here's what he says. Blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Up to this point, it's all uh, plural. It's many. It's uh, all of them and, and numbers. But then he says, in your seed, we're back to singular at Abraham's seed, singular, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. In that seed, the same seed we saw 
back in Genesis, the same one that Paul says was singular, speaking of Christ. Same one. So if they knew it, they know somebody's coming, and it's going to take the gates of the enemies. Everybody's going to be blessed after that. So this is what they're being taught. This is what they're gathering around. The Messiah's coming. It's going to be great. Go to the next one. And this is about... Uh, um, the prophecy that Jacob gave over all of his sons. And he said this about Judah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. So they knew the Messiah would be coming out of Judah. Now these guys were sitting with Jesus. And I'm sure they came out of there saying, this guy's from the tribe of Judah. And so things were fitting for them. Go to the next one. This is Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. I will raise up for, you, for them a prophet like you. This is God speaking to Moses. And he's telling Moses, I'm going to raise up another one like you. Well, Moses was a deliverer. He delivered them into physical. Here comes one who's going to deliver them spiritually. And they don't get that. They don't understand that. I'm going to raise him up from among their brethren. So he's coming out of Israel. He's coming out of the group. And will put, I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command him, and it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. So one is coming that they were looking for. That's why one of the questions that John the Baptist was, are you the prophet? They didn't have it all lined up that it was the same one. But he was coming and he was going to speak the words of God. And if they did not obey those words, he would require it of them. And Jesus has given us the invitation he's given us his life and and that word is going forth and people are either saying yes or they're saying no to that word and how many of you know when the end comes we're all going to be accountable for it you're not going to hear it and say well i'm just going to be okay by not doing anything no by doing nothing you have said no by not receiving you have rejected the message and that word will be required of you then he, they said, and what the prophets have told us. So let's look at what they were looking at. There, there's many more. We're just picking out a few of them because we don't have time to go over all of them. This is what they saw in the prophets. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. So they're looking for somebody who's going to be born. They know it's going to be somebody that's going to be born. Remember, Daniel prophesied 490 years. So when Jesus was being born, they were looking for a Messiah to be born. You have to understand that. That's why all the excitement, that's why all the anticipation, that's why Anna went around and told everybody at the, in the temple of, uh, that, that, that Simeon had said, the baby's here. They were all excited because they were waiting for it. And when he was... At the age of adulthood, they were looking for a Messiah then to appear, to show. Not to be born, now they were waiting for it to come. All based on the prophecies. All based on that. So, a child's going to be born, the government's going to be put on his shoulder, his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I mean, that's why the Hallelujah Chorus is so great. That is great poetry there. I wish I had written that. That is incredible. I mean, those are just good. And, and that was written there for them to see and, and to enjoy that and say, this, wow, this is him. He's going to come. He's going to take over the government. It's going to be put on him. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. From that time forward, when it is established, from that time forward, it's going to be increasing. So if this is what I'm anticipating, when he shows up, what are we going to do? He's going to have the government put on his shoulders. And it's going to go from that time forward forever. Do you understand why I, you know, somebody would get excited and just say, if this is the one, we're about ready to take the government. We're about ready to kick these Romans out. It's about ready to happen. There's an excitement. They, they were studying this stuff. You know, we think these disciples were just like, oh, they're all fishermen that don't know anything. But yet we found out they were with part of a group that were studying, looking, anticipating, waiting for. Looking for it. They were with John, the, the biggest move, waiting for the next one when John pointed. And they, and they went. 
And they're anticipating this. You know, Jesus has started his government. And how many of you know it's increasing every day? From the moment it was established until now, it's been increasing. It's increasing right now. You may say, well, it doesn't seem like much is happening here. No, the United States is in a place of decision. I mean, honestly, in the midst of our leaders rejecting, we better have a revival amongst ourselves. I'm telling you that. We better have a, a turn to God amongst ourselves. Because because God is moving with or without us. You know, and Asia, Asia is coming in. Listen, that 1040 window, everybody's been praying about the Middle East and all those areas. I mean, remember, uh, Pastor Tim Delina, when he was here, said the guy that, that often goes over to the Middle East when he came back said I had to baptize 10 Iraqis and they say it's happening all the time. That people in the Muslim society are going, ISIS, is that our best? Is that the best we can do? Is that, if you're a pure, uh, you know, is, Islam or, or Muslim, that's what you end up doing and people are turning away from it and they're looking for the real answer. That's why people are coming to Christ in large numbers right now. Africa still is having large numbers come to the Lord. You know, just because we don't see it here, don't think it's not happening. The increase of his government is going to go on until the end. You can hear about any other religion growing. Christianity is growing faster. Don't, don't let people deceive you on that one. It doesn't mean we're not going to be persecuted because in the midst, remember when the explosion was happening in Jerusalem, what came with it? Persecution. You want to know why the persecution of Christianity is increasing? Because there is an ever-increasing government of God happening. The more he gets hearts, the more the persecution is turned on. So under, just understand that. And uh, so they were looking for somebody who was going to come and take over things. Go to the next one. This is Jeremiah 33, verse 14. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel, to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David, because they were looking for it to come out of David and Judah, a branch of righteousness. What is he going to do? When he shows up, what's going to happen? He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell safely. Doesn't that sound like if you get with this guy, Jerusalem's going to be set free from Roman tyranny? Doesn't that sound like it? And Judah's going to be safe, and this is incredible. When he shows up, it's going to be wonderful. That's what they were getting under. That's what they were believing. And this is the name by which she will be called, the Lord our righteousness. So Jerusalem is going to have that. For thus the Lord says, David shall ne never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Of course, once Jesus showed up, there was no need for anybody else. You have to understand it. It's an eternal throne now through Jesus, so nobody else needs to come. When Israel was demolished and, and it didn't matter, uh, Jesus was it forever. But they were anticipating somebody who would come and kick out the group that was there, and they would, he would go from birth to adulthood to being made king and to everything being changed, and it would stay that way forever. That's what they were looking for. Sounds incredible, but that's where they were based on these scriptures because that's what it's talking about. That's what it's saying. And then add this one to it. Uh, go, go to the next one. Rejoice greatly. Uh, this is Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly, riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. <laughs> so as he got on that donkey and went through town, remember the scriptures say, they then remembered. Remember, they've been looking for the Messiah. So he goes in and it says, and then they remembered. Oh, this is what he was going to do. This is what he's supposed to be doing. Do you understand? They got in there and said, we're going to take the kingdom. I mean, it was building, 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 and now he fulfills this one right in front of them, and they remember. And so we're going in to take the kingdom. Listen, when they go in and he disrupts the temple, and it's like, okay, this is it, man. He's doing it again. We're about ready to take everything. And then for three days he doesn't. He teaches like normal. 
He passes every test that they gave him for questions and he's not doing anything. It's during that time period that Judas does the betrayal. Judas came in ready to take the kingdom. Jesus comes in and he doesn't. Are you kidding me? What is going on? We've been arguing about position. Remember those disciples have been arguing about who's going who's to be first, second, third, fourth. Let me tell you, that wasn't talking future. That was talking present. They were saying, who's going to be what? Who's going to be Secretary of State? Who wants that job? Who's going to be Treasurer? Judas wanted that job. And he goes in, they're going to take the kingdom, and he didn't get what he'd been wanting all the time. I, you know, you don't have to believe this, but I believe that's why he then betrays, not so he can get rid of Jesus, but so he can get the power. You know, for power, you'll betray your friend. For lust, you'll betray a friend. You can love somebody and betray him because you submit to power, you submit to something else. I believe that's what he did, betrayed him. And when they, instead of Jesus taking the kingdom, he let him take him. He didn't fight him. He let him take him. The next day, Judas kills himself. That's not a betrayer. If you understand what I'm saying, that's not a betrayer of heart. He was duped by the devil. Remember, the devil entered him and he went and did it. He even had Jesus. Think about it. He's thinking, I'll do it for power. And then Jesus himself says, what you do, go do quickly. And he's going, good, he's in on this. I'll betray him. We'll take over the kingdom. It'll be great. Now, see, you don't have to believe this. You don't have to believe this. It's not there. I believe it's there. But I believe, great. And he goes. And when he kisses, Jesus says, Judas, you betrayed me with a kiss. That cut him to the heart when it was all over. I know it cut him to the heart. He betrayed a friend, missing, not understanding the things of God. And when he did not take the kingdom, he gave it up for the cross. Judas killed himself the next day. Didn't know how to handle it. He wasn't trying to figure out how to get power now. He had betrayed his best friend. And he couldn't do a thing about it except kill himself. Remember at the Lord's Supper there, they were having it. They're getting ready to go. And Peter asked, the, wasn't it? I think it was Peter who asked the question, uh, Lord, how many swords do we need? Remember they asked that question. Why, did, why does he think we're going to leave this dinner and we need swords? Why, and why do we have to start counting? Because we're about ready to take the kingdom. How many swords do we need? And Jesus says, how many you got? He goes, two. He says, oh, that's good. <laughs> and they had, to, you know, think about it. They had to go, oh, man, that's, that's good. He, he's that good. We'll do it with two swords. I don't know how, but we're going to take the kingdom with two swords. We're going to somehow beat the Roman. And why would they think that? This dude walks on water. This dude can tell a storm to stop, and we saw it become like glass. This dude had people trying to throw him off a hill, and suddenly it was like they weren't even there. And he walks through the crowd. This dude has people with stones. They're ready. We saw their hate and anger. And then he just walks through, and they all put their stones down, and nobody touches him. This dude had an answer for everybody. Anybody who came he, he would say a word and change the whole, switch, the whole situation with just... And so, okay, two swords, great. I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to take the kingdom right now with two swords because they saw these scriptures. Let me just throw this one in. Uh, two swords back then was like having two sidearms. That was their sidearms of the day. So in other words, the disciples carried. <laughs> yeah, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. Okay. Now look, but I can guarantee you this, the crazy people weren't carrying. Come on. Don't, don't give yourself or your kids any weapon to carry if they don't know how to handle it, if they don't know how to take care of it, all right? All right, but I'm just saying, 
Jesus didn't. Think about it. This is Jesus, Son of God. But he didn't mind the criminals seeing the swords. They walked around for three and a half years, and at any time, I bet you, you could have found those swords. I'm just saying. You see, even Jesus, I mean, there is a thing that we are being foolish, and there's a thing where you're being wise. So let's be wise. Let's be wise. And understand when people are saying everybody ought to have guns, and when somebody else is saying nobody should have guns, maybe both of them are wrong. Okay? Uh, but you ought to be wise. All right, I'll leave that alone right there. <laughs> So they were ready to take the kingdom because they did not know all the scriptures. You know, sometimes you can know a few scriptures and really harp on those scriptures and get really good in those scriptures. And because you're not getting the whole of the scriptures, you can get out of whack. And they were blind because they only knew a few of them. They got some of it right, but what they got wrong was almost devastating because they did not understand these scriptures. Go to this, Isaiah 53. See, they did not know this was Jesus also. They did not know what to do with these scriptures. The teachers didn't know, because once they taught Messiah as never dying, never they didn't know what to do with this. That's where I told you they had a teaching of major Messiah, minor Messiah. They could get rid of these on a minor Messiah. Somebody's going to die for Israel someday. And he's going to somehow save them, but, but they didn't put it with major Messiah. Come on, remember when, when Peter, when, when Jesus was out there and said, who do people say that I am? And, and these disciples were saying, well, people out there are saying, maybe, maybe you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Maybe you're Elijah. He said, but who do you say? And Peter said, you're the Christ. And he says, Simon Bar-Jonah, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not shown you this, but my Father in heaven showed it to you. And Peter's probably like, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. And then it says Jesus began to immediately speak of his impending death. He began to say he's going to be abused by the Gentiles, turned over to him to be killed. And can you imagine? These guys, they're ready to take the kingdom. They're all coming that he's the Messiah. And now Peter has made his public proclamation of the same thing. And now Jesus is talking about dying. And when he's done, it says Peter then takes him. Can you imagine this? He takes him aside and rebukes Jesus. <laughs> he rebukes him. And how does he rebuke him? By saying, according to those other scriptures, Jesus! Don't you understand? You shall never die. You see? We're coming to take the kingdom. You're never going to die. And Jesus says those incredible words. Get away from me, Satan. He said, you do not understand the things of God. So here's Peter still with that, and they kept that mindset all the way through because that was their teaching, that was their understanding. Jesus didn't fight it. He gave them the new information, and it wasn't computing. And he said, you don't understand. And I don't think Peter bothered to rebuke Jesus anymore. He didn't want to be called Satan anymore. Because <laughs> they were going to take the kingdom, but yet Jesus knew who he was also. He was also the scripture. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he hid, as it were, uh, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. See, we thought of it this way. Our leaders thought of it this way. They rejected who he was, and they said it was because... God was against him that this was happening to him. Can you imagine if you were taught the Messiah will never die, and then you see Jesus hanging on the cross, and anyone who hangs on the tree is cursed according to their own scriptures, 
And can you imagine, if you can't see it, you're blind as a bat, you now ridicule him because you say, well, he must be there because of God, because no Messiah would be on a cross. No Messiah would be being killed by the Romans. A Messiah would, would beat the Romans, not be killed by the Romans. And so they railed at him all the more. They hated him all the more. They jeered him all the more. He said, oh, you healed others? Then heal yourself. Bring yourself down from the cross. If you are the Messiah, get off that cross. And the hate increased because now... He was doing things they said could not happen to the Messiah. Come on, are you getting this? Isaiah prophesied it and said, we thought, we thought God was doing this because we had rejected him. And how could Messiah have this happen? But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded. Can you ever put your name there? He was wounded for Rick Betts' transgressions. Put your name there. He was bruised for Rick Betts' iniquities. Put your name there. That's why he was there. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. Your depression, your torment, your lack of sleep, your mental illness, whatever people would say it is, whatever you battle in the mind was upon him that day. And by his stripes... His wounds, the thorns, the piercings, we were healed. We were healed. We were given an opportunity for healing in body, in life, in our mind, and spiritually forever. It's all wrapped up in that. And look at the next one. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have... Turned everyone to his own way. He did all that for us and we're just going our own way. Every one of us in our own way. We couldn't serve God except he helped us serve God. We're all wild. We've been wild since Adam messed up. We've gone our own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. We've been going crazy, but, but he laid that penalty on him. Laid it on him. Put it all there. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. You know, Jesus stopped so much by just talking. He could have stopped this at any minute. What did he say? He said, Peter, do you not know I could call 12 legions of angels? One word out of his mouth could have stopped it all. He could have said words in Caiaphas' court and saved himself. He could have said things with Pontius Pilate that would have melted Pontius Pilate and saved himself. He could have said things to the soldiers and saved himself. He could have said things even on the cross and could have saved himself. But he kept that powerful word silent. He did not free himself. He did not turn from his task. And he did not complain about it. Can you imagine what he was having to bear and suffer for me and for you? And he did not complain one bit. What do you and I complain about? Come on. What, what, let me just think, you, you just think, what's the last thing you complained about? Does it match up to what he did without complaint against you? What is it we complain about? On Friday, I had a good complaint. I, I, I complained. I had a good one. You know, the, the, uh, Gail and I went out, and, and uh, Alan and Aaron, we went out, and we stopped at a, at a food place, you know, a fast food type thing. And we went in there, and, and we ordered our stuff. 
and we sat down and they bring it out to the and set it on the table when it comes and and so everything came out and everything was there except what the, the the drink I had ordered well I didn't order a drink they had a little special thing there on a strawberry banana milkshake and I told yeah I said you know what I'm going to not do the water today I'm going to get that strawberry banana milkshake I'll be good small <laughs> So I ordered strawberry banana milkshake. See, I've never had one there, and I thought, let's see how it is. So everything came out except my strawberry banana milkshake. So they delivered everything, and the guy goes back. I'm saying, well, I guess they're going to be bringing it. It is a little different than everybody else's. So we start to eat, and I'm listening. I'm waiting to hear the milkshake thing go. <laughs> I'm just listening because it's right there. I mean, it's like, like 10 feet away from me. I could have been making my own milkshake, but... <laughs> I'm just waiting for them to do it. It's their job. And so I'm just listening, and we're eating, and it's not happening. And so the guy who brought the tray, I go to him, and I go to him, and I say, hey, <laughs> the milkshake that I was supposed to get, I paid for, is not here. It's strawberry banana right, right there. And, 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 you know, he looked at me, and he did his head like that, but his eyes said, I don't care. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was like his eyes said, I don't care. Now, he was the dude that brought the stuff out. I figured he should care. He brought stuff out that didn't have my stuff. He should be the one caring, right? But he goes, but his eyes said, I don't care. And that's what I felt. But, you know, I'm being nice, and I go back to my seat. So he, now he knows. And so we're, st we're still eating, and I'm waiting to hear and it's not happening and it's like going on and I'm like what what is like whatever and then I, I do hear I hear it Boom, okay all right and then it goes to the dude that walked up and ordered it and walked back out so he got his milkshake and he's out I haven't got my milkshake and I told him I didn't get my milkshake and so so I go okay well I'm not going to talk to mr. I don't care eyes I'm gonna go to the lady that's doing the register and she's right there, and nobody's there. There's nobody in line. All the line has gone now. There's nobody there, just me and her. And I go to her, and I said, hey, <laughs> I didn't get my, my milkshake. I, I, you know, I paid for it right here. And she said, is that a junior? Or I said, I don't know. It just was, was this one right here. Uh, it's small, you know. And, uh, and she goes, okay, I'll take care of that. I said, good. And I'm still nice. I go back. And we're going, now we're like, we were at like a third left of our meal there. And then we get done with our meal. We've all eaten. And I'm looking, she's just waiting on customers and doing this and standing around there talking to each other. And now we're done our meal. And I go, okay. And Gail says, Rick. Because <laughs> I'm, you know, hey, I was in business. I knew how you take care of people. You don't sit, if they, if, if they come in. You're asking them to come in so you can serve them, and then you don't serve them, and then they tell you something was wrong, and then you don't do it, and then they tell you, and you don't do it again. Uh, you know, just as, you know, just as my, the fact that I've been there, uh, you know, I'm thinking, surely the owner doesn't know his people are acting like this. So I, I'm going to help him. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so I'm like, this, I mean, they, they didn't do it, and Gail's like, Rick, and I said, well, you want to go? I said, you, and the boys were there, you know. I said, you guys want to go? You can do it. I mean, because if I go, I don't know. <laughs> I'm being serious. And, and so then it's like, uh, they waited too long. They sat down too long. I stood up. I said, okay, I'm going. <laughs> and, and I walked over. I found the guy with the eyes that said it. And another dude was with him. They came together. And that dude, I hadn't asked that dude anything. But that dude came in. And so now the two of them were there. And I said, Hey. This time I'm like double the volume, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't care. I didn't, and it's like you know, it's like a little subway or something. It's not wasn't a subway, but it was like a about that you know. So everybody in the room hears me, <laughs> and I said, "Hey, this is the third time I've been up here now." And I said, "I told you there was the, the milkshake, and and told you to get it. And nobody did it. So, uh, and then the the new guy who I hadn't talked to, he goes right away. He said, "Sir, would you like your money back?" I mean, that fast. Sir, would you like your money back? I go, no, I like this milkshake I bought. You got the money. 
<laughs> and I said, and I'm telling you, which one of you two are going to make it? Tell me right now, which one of you is going to go make it right now? And the new guy goes, zip, goes right over there. I'm like, okay. And I'm looking in my Gail and the boys are over there. <laughs> I mean, you know, I did pretty good. I didn't make any big gestures for the camera or anything. I was just like this. Uh, I don't know if they went to Crossroad or if they used to go to Crossroad. <laughs> you know, I run into those people all the time. So it's like, that was Pastor Rick yelling at us. I wasn't yelling. I'm just telling you, I was not yelling. I was just preaching. <laughs> So the dude goes over and he's doing it and his face is getting all red, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm down here, I'm, I'm saying, guys, I had to do it. I'm just, I just had to do it. And I'm looking up and every now and he's going, and he's looking over. So then he comes up and he brings it to his head. This is the guy I didn't talk to. All right. This is the first time he does it. He's a good guy. And, uh, and he comes to the table and he just does it like this. <laughs> puts it on like that and I said hey 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 you come here, come here, come here. and so he's kind of walking away he starts coming back I said I said I'm sorry for getting loud I said it's not your fault I said the other ones I'd asked it was my third time up there I said but that's not on you you did good thank you for my milkshake you know and then he goes out and he's still red and he's like whatever but <laughs> I'm like okay so well, now everybody's done we got no food anyway so I'm walking out and I take a sip of my milkshake and I should have got my money back. But... <laughs> Zach, it was not a Chick-fil-A milkshake. Just put it that way. Chick-fil-A would have had me. That, 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 that thing's good. This one was not. This one was not. Uh, so I go home. I give it to the cats. Cats liked it. Cats didn't care. They, they, they ate it up, man. They liked it. And I looked, it was a full moon, so I could blame it on the moon. If we had a full moon, I blame it on the moon. But you know, Jesus took nails in his hands and his feet, and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. See, that's the difference between me and my Savior. That's the difference between us and our Savior. See, a lot of you got it and said, yeah, go, you tell them, because that, that happens to me. Or by the third or fourth time, I'd be up there with you, Rick. Yep, yep, you'd be up there with me, and we'd all be showing why we're not like Jesus. Because he took death that he did not deserve. He took stripes that were not his. He took pain that was ours. He took chastisement he did not deserve nails and pain all for us without one complaint they didn't know this one either in Psalms 22 where it says this they gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion I am poured out like water all my bones are out of joint my heart is like wax it has melted within me my strength is dried up like a pot's herd and my tongue clings to my jaws you have brought me to the dust of death for dogs have surrounded me the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me they pierced my hands and my feet I can count all my bones they look and stare at me they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots Psalm 22, a picture of Jesus on the cross. They didn't know that was Jesus either. But when they pierced his hands and he forgave them and they hung him up, the first words out of his mouth was, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And anybody who studied the scriptures would know he just pointed them to Psalm 22. And if they would go and read Psalm 22, they would be seeing prophecy fulfilled in front of their very eyes. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then they cast lots for his garments. And they fulfill those scriptures. 
They didn't know that. And we need to know it again. And we need to know our God and to live for that God and love that God. Look what he says for Israel. Go to the next one, Zechariah 12. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they've pierced. He says there's a day coming when I'm going to pour my spirit out on them in such a way that it will be drawing them in and they will look on me, the one they pierced, the one they rejected. And yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only child and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. They will move into a spirit of repentance like we've never seen in all the world. God will draw Israel in in a day. He will reveal himself and all those that have been looking for the Messiah will see him on that day. They will mourn and weep that they rejected him and that what they had done to him. Go to the last one, Zechariah 13, verse 6. And one will say to him, what are these wounds between your arms? And then he will answer, these with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. These wounds came from you, but I did not reject you. These wounds came from you, but I still loved you. These wounds came for the whole world, but yet I've loved the whole world. That's our God. That's our Savior. That's who Philip and Andrew and John and Peter and Nathaniel, that's the one they were looking for. They just didn't know it, that it was that great. They were looking at the power things. God was looking at the totality. They thought their need was to get rid of the Romans. God knew their need was to get rid of their sins. He loved us with an everlasting love. Do you know that God? Do you give that God time? I'm telling you, if I could put myself in that meeting with John and Andrew when, when Jesus changed them that night, I would love. If I had my top ten, that'd be one of them. When Jesus met with Philip and he came running out having to find Nathaniel, I would like to have been in that meeting. The road to Emmaus when he revealed himself all throughout the Old Testament to those two disciples i would love to have been in that walk you know when jesus with, with, was with zacchaeus and he jumps up and wants to give half his property away i would have loved to have been at that dinner but you know what i can't be at any of those places you know where i can be where i put myself where, where he tells me to be when i give myself time to be with jesus when he puts me with a group in a small setting and his spirit comes in richly like last tuesday's night of praise and prayer that was fantastic if anybody was at that praise and prayer that that was an awesome thing I, I i'm still affected by that night that was an incredible night when you put yourself into places god would have you it has an effect it has a ministry are you putting yourself in his presence are you letting god reveal to you who he is i hope he revealed something to you today about who he is why don't you stand All right, and somebody may be here. You may say, I don't know Jesus like that. I didn't know he was my Lord and Savior. I didn't know he died for my sin. I didn't know he made a way for me to have fellowship with God. If you've never received the work of the cross, if you've never given him your life and said, I'm going to stop living for me, I'm going to start living for you. If you've never done that, and you know God's drawing you right now to do that, then we'll say a prayer. I'll lead you in a prayer of committing your heart, your life, everything to the Lord and your brothers and sisters that are here that understand they're going to be glad for you, celebrate with you. They'll even say the prayer with you. But you have to be bold in front of men and women. You raise that hand and say, Pastor Rick, it's me. I need this prayer today. If that's you, then brother, sister, be bold. Give it over to God. Nobody's ever going to love you like that. Give your life to him today. If that's you, then raise your hand boldly and we'll say this prayer. I see that hand back there, brother. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. Praise God. Anybody else? Just raise it high so we can see it. Give your life to him today. Give him all your heart. See that hand there. Anybody else? Am I missing any hands? Okay. 
All right, praise God. Well, we'll go say this with your brother. God knows what he's doing. God knows why you're here at this moment, why you've raised your hand. He's about ready to do an incredible thing in your life. We're going to say this prayer with you, but say it from your heart. Say it from your heart. Dear Lord, I thank you for today. The words I've heard, you've used them to draw me to yourself. So right now, in front of all these witnesses, I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior. Come live in me. Thank you for dying for my sin and removing them out of the way. I turn from them and choose to live for you. Holy Spirit, come and fill me now. Teach me the ways of Jesus, that I might follow after him all the days of my life. And according to your word, as I do this, I can declare by faith that I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Woo, amen, brother. <laughs> awesome. Praise God. And the usher's got a packet there for you. It's got helps in it. We want to give that to you. But please, take that to the Welcome Center. We want to invest in your decision. we got a brand new study Bible we want to give you. It's in the same scriptures you've been looking at up here. And uh, just keep following after the Lord. Keep coming to fellowship. Let God continue what he's doing there. If you don't have a place, you got one now if you want it. Amen, brother. Amen. Welcome to the family, man. Welcome to the family. All right, you know what we got? Seven days. You know, are we going to display that type of love? Are we going to be ready to fellowship with the Lord? Because we take that out there. We are his hands and feet now. That kind of love is what we take out there. You know, when, when, I, was, you know, when I was doing that milkshake, tasting it and saying, oh, ugh, that wasn't too good. But at that moment, I was saying, why did I let that get under me so bad? Why couldn't I do it even better than I did it? You could still do it, but you could have had it better. But I was, I was losing it. So you become aware. You become aware of still how far away we are from where he's at. He could have done it in a much better way, a much wiser way. Nobody, nobody would have said in there, I don't know how Jesus could have done that better. <laughs> no, there's lots of people who could have said, oh, Jesus could have done that better. I mean, yesterday, Aaron, when we were done, my son Aaron, he goes, yeah, Dad, I don't remember you getting like that in a long time. That was, that was pretty, that was, that was a little different, yeah. You know, but it just makes us so aware that if the seven days are going to be productive in God, he's got to have dom predominance. He's got to be in his place. So, guys, have a great seven days. Let sin decrease. Let righteousness increase. And we only can do that by fellowship with Jesus. It's fellowship with Jesus that makes him shine so well. So let's do that and let's let him touch the world, okay? Heavenly Father, thank you for the brothers and sisters that are here. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for the heart that's given his life to you today. And Lord, may you move mightily in us, Lord, that we would be your vessels, that we would be your sons and daughters. Direct us by the Spirit. May we be open to hear, open to speak, willing to obey in faith. And, Lord, grateful that this many is going to touch so many this week. So many people you want to put in their path and touch them. And you said if you be lifted up, you would draw all people to yourself. So, Lord, may you be lifted up in the lives of your people here today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said.